you know, depending on your translation, the Bible that you read through, nearly 20 to 25 times you'll find the phrase, I am with you from the Lord. And Jesus makes this promise as he gives us the great commission. When he says to go therefore and make disciples, he promises that I am with you. And I've been meditating on that idea for the last several weeks. I come to the conclusion that ultimately, while we're scattered as a church that we've come together this morning, isolation is a lie. And the enemy's working overtime right now to convince us that, well, we're alone. But God tells us, I am with you. I just want that to encourage our hearts, especially if you're viewing things at a distance online and you're feeling isolated or separated. Just remember the Lord is always with us. It's a wonderful reality, a divine reality that we can know this morning. I just want to take a few minutes and I want to, I want to pray and just thank God for that. Can we do that? Well, Father, we come before you with full hearts. We adore you. We praise you that you are sovereign. We praise you that you are omnipresent, that you are with us at all times, that we are never, ever alone. You are our rock, our fortress. You sent forth your spirit to help us. Lord, we are never, ever alone, and we know that isolation is a lie. Lord, so I just pray that you would encourage each and every one of our hearts with that divine truth, that reality that for those who are in Christ Jesus, you are always with them. Lord, we want to lift up specifically this morning the Tossig family as they are out doing mighty work for the kingdom, where they're doing a hard work. Would you remind them this morning that you are with them, that the work that they're doing in carrying out the Great Commission, they are not striving in their own strength, but they are empowered by the gift of the Helper, the Holy Spirit, your presence in their lives and hearts. Father, strengthen them this morning as they've been able to come together and worship with extended family here at Westbrook. We thank you for them. Just pray that they walk away with their fire just stoked, Lord, as they hear a word from you. And God, we pray for, for everyone right now who is Viewing things at a distance, Lord, would you remind them of that truth? Lord, that COVID doesn't take away your presence, nor does it stop the Great Commission. But Lord, we're called to strengthen each other. So I pray that you continue to provide avenues for people to connect during this strange season. Just remind all of our hearts this morning that you are sovereign and you are good. And those two things together are incredible. So we thank you for that, Lord. We pray that you be with us for the rest of this time, for the preaching, the proclamation of your word this morning. Would you be with Pastor John as he comes forward to deliver a message from you? Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus who brings us together. And it's in his holy name that we pray. Amen. A reading from Acts 20, 17 through 38. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I sent foot, set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How did I not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in, the, in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and infliction await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. 
If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you, none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among you your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is uh, able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I covet no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Now he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all because of the word he he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Thank you, dear Paige. Please turn to the person next to you and smile at them. Oh, it's good to be together. And it is wonderful to greet the Tossig family, some of them here today. And I just also want to say, uh, you know, we will be sending Ricky and Autumn away next week to another church. Ricky and Autumn, you two are so wonderful. And next Sunday is going to be a, a precious, precious time. And I. I will let the cat out of the bag this morning and say that young Jake McCaslin sitting there is going to be apprenticing with us in, uh, just stand up a sec, Jake, and, and uh, pull, pull your mask down for one sec. All right. So, you know, we're already excited about, about that, Jake. That's good news. Good news. It's so wonderful to be gathered together this morning. I couldn't decide whether to start this morning's message by quoting Eric Clapton or Hudson Taylor. Um, But I'm going to start with Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton has called Robert Johnson the greatest blues guitarist of all time. The story goes that Johnson gave his soul to the devil on a lonely, dusty crossroads in Mississippi in return for his musical talent. Johnson lived only 27 years, becoming the first of many rock musicians who strangely died at that very age. Their names make up a gruesome, dead rock stars hall of fame. Brian Jones, Alan Wilson, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Peter Ham. What, what was his band? Come on. Badfinger. Who said that? Way to go, Rick. There's a prize for you. Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, to name a few. Their causes of death are tragic and speak of the nature of the master those musicians served. Hanging, heroin overdose, alcohol poisoning, gunshot, asphyxiation, drowning. We could go on and on. Whether Robert Johnson actually made a pact with Satan at the crossroads or whether it's only legend is up for debate. But regardless, Robert Johnson, you and I serve Satan by default. 
unless God does a wonderful work of grace in our lives and we become the happy servants of Jesus. The devil is a hard master. He entices those born on his plantation into deeper and deeper service with promise after promise of pleasure and profit. Not all of his servants live hard and die young. Some will live long lives of ease and comfort. However, in the long run, the road is the same for all without Jesus. Emptiness, death, and hell. There is plenty of fine print in his gilded contract that few bother to read. But in it is found the bitter truth about what service to him really costs. He demands nothing less than your very soul. By contrast, there's no fine print in service to Jesus. He spells it out from the beginning, his terms of service. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and lose his soul? There is a sweetness, a sweetness in the service of Jesus. If you think serving Jesus is a chore, then you have faulty ideas about Jesus. For the sweetness is sourced in Jesus himself. He is a wonderful Savior, a precious friend, a brother, Lord, and Master, and our reward is nothing less than Him. Well, we get to Acts chapter 19 and 20, and we're on a gallop, but we're going to stop at one verse in Acts chapter 20, verse 22, but we've got to fly over chapter 19 for a moment. By this time, Acts chapter 19 and 20 Paul, this God-centered, gospel-saturated, Jesus-loving, spirit-empowered man, it's the kind of person I want to be, Paul, whose name literally means little one, by this time he's been used in a manner totally disproportionate to who he is. He's nearing the end of his long life of public ministry. Ahead is capture, imprisonment, loss of liberty, loss of life, all because of one confession. Jesus Christ is Lord. That confession, Jesus Christ is Lord, is enough to get you to heaven and in most places on earth get you there quickly. It's the basic Christian confession. In Acts chapter 19 and 20, mainly he's ministering in the city of Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 and 20. He spent three years there. Ephesus was a wild city. It was a vital city of commerce. It's no longer there today. It's just ruins there now. The apostle Timothy, or the disciple Timothy, spent his last or his life as the minister there, and the apostle John spent the end of his life there taking care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Ephesus. It was given over to a goddess called Artemis, who was worshipped through prostitute worship, temple prostitution, and all cultures, all people and all cultures finally become like the god or gods they worship. In Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 8, going very quickly, Paul arrives there and he finds some disciples, but they're not happy. There's no joy in them. And he says, what baptism did you receive? It couldn't have been Jesus's, because Jesus makes people happy. And I sometimes wonder if Paul came in my midst or our midst, if he'd say, well, hang on a sec. You guys followers of Jesus? Don't see a lot of joy going on. Maybe he might say that. And they said, well, we, we only heard about John the Baptist who baptized us, telling us to stop doing things. And we've stopped. 
And then Paul said, well, let me tell you the second story about Jesus, the second half of the story, Jesus dying on the cross for your sins and freedom and new life. And they said, that's what we need. And they were baptized in the name of Jesus. You can read about it in Acts 19, 1 to 8. And the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they had a Pentecost just like the Jews had had one, and just like the people in Caesarea had had one, they had one. And then in Acts chapter 19, verses 8 to 41, going very fast here, there are revivals and there are riots. All because of the preaching of the gospel. We hear that Paul did extraordinary miracles. A miracle is already extraordinary, so I don't know what an extraordinary miracle would look like. There were spiritual clashes. So many people came to Jesus that they brought all their books about sorcery out, placed them in a pile, and burned them, and it was worth millions what they burned. This caused a riot when Paul said to them plainly, your man-made gods are not gods. He challenged their culture and their religion. Now, many of us these days want a carefree Christianity, but when you read the book of Acts, you realize it's not on offer. And I think one of the problems with the church these days is we want a carefree Christianity. We want to believe in Jesus, have our church, our life, and we don't want to be bothered. And we don't want to bother the world, but we are called to bother the world with the gospel of Jesus. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if Overland Park knew that there is the church of Jesus in this town. And Westbrook was part of that witness. And we were people who radically loved and a people who would not endure foolishness and were not afraid to be prophetic in our age. In Acts chapter 20, we see a dead man raised. Paul preaches so long in Acts chapter 20 in, in the city of Troas that a man named Eutychus falls out the window. There's a few lessons there. One, if you fall asleep in church, make sure you're in a good, safe place because there are Eutychians among us today. The sons of Eutychus are alive and well in the church of Jesus. But there are three really cool things about this little episode of Eutychus. Very quickly, number one, it's clear they were worshiping on Sunday. It's right there in the text. Number two, they broke bread and had communion together. And number three, they listened to the Bible taught. There's a picture of the early church. Eutychus falls out the window dead. Paul throws himself upon him, prays over him, and he's raised back to life. It's a glorious event that happens. And then Paul travels and ends up in Miletus and calls for the Ephesian elders to travel a day's journey to him so he can say goodbye to them. And that's what was read this morning so wonderfully by Paige. And we're actually going to spend two weeks on this one passage because we're going to use this with Ricky and Autumn next week because this is a farewell passage. But I'd like us to focus this morning sort of part B on overcoming a spirit of fear on chapter 20, verse 22. It's one of these verses you can read right over and not notice something profoundly important about discipleship in it. And now, compelled by the Spirit, God's calling me to do this. Compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I want to focus on these words, not knowing what will happen to me there. Because we want to know, don't we? We want to know what's going to happen to us. And we want, almost want a guarantee, Lord, if you can guarantee me that things will go well, I will follow you. There are even TV preachers. There's some guy in Houston apparently has the biggest church in the history of the universe. And his whole strap line is that your best life can be now. You can know. You, can, you don't have to worry about a thing. Here's Paul, thank you. That, you got a young preacher coming here. Not knowing what will happen to me. 
I want to share about the freedom of not knowing. How wonderful it is to say, I walk by faith, not by sight, and I don't know, and I don't need to know. And I see four things about discipleship in this statement from Paul's. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Number one, a disciple relinquishes self-determination. A disciple no longer has the right to determine his own life. Notice what Paul says. He goes on and says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prisons and hardships are facing me. I know that. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the grace of God. Do you see where his freedom comes from? The freedom of not knowing is based in the fact that he's trusting in the character of God. I know in every city trouble and hardships await me. But that's okay because I do not consider my life, my plans, my hopes, my dreams, my longevity, my health, my well-being. I do not consider these things of importance to me. Now just stop there. Really? Certainly we can't apply that same kind of radical disposition to ourselves. Certainly that's only for people in the Bible. Or maybe missionaries. Maybe a few select Christians, but the rest of us we're supposed to love our lives, aren't we? What did Jesus say? Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. Listen to these words of Jesus. If anyone... Now raise your hand. Yes, raise your hand. If you fit in the category of anyone, raise your hand. Anybody else? Come on. There's a few people who aren't raising their hands. You think, I'm, not, I'm a nobody. You're not a nobody. You're an anyone. If anyone would come after me, that's Jesus, he must, not he should or he might, or think about it or pray about it, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me for whoever... Now raise your hand if you fit in the category of whoever. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose her or forfeit his very self? So apparently what Paul tells us in chapter 20, verse 22, uh, verse 24, however I consider my life worth nothing to me, is a template for the Christian life, not an exception for the Christian life. Brothers and sisters, a disciple relinquishes self-determination. A disciple relinquishes the right to know where his life is heading. Lord, reveal everything to me and I will obey. No, you never would. You would freak out. Today there are 100 million or more Christians in China. Think about that. A hundred million or more. In 1949, Mao Zedong kicked all the Christian missionaries out of the country and stomped on the church and thought he killed it. Today there are a hundred million or more believers there, millions of whom will trace their spiritual heritage 
back to one man from England named Hudson Taylor who went there in the 1860s. If God had said to him, Hudson, the establishment of the church in China through your ministry is going to cost you three children and your wife. You'll bury them all there. He probably would have said, I'll never go. I can't go. There's freedom in not knowing. There's freedom in saying, I trust God with my life. I don't know the future. And brothers and sisters, we want to know too much. And it keeps us from following Jesus. We must relinquish self-determination if we're going to get on with gospel work and enjoy this Savior we have. In 2012, my wife and I moved here from England, having been there for 26 years and pastoring a wonderful church there. We moved here to embark on a different ministry, and it was a declaration of ours. We will not pastor a church again. <laughs> and certainly not in the, in the USA. Certainly not. Not because we don't love America, but because our, we have hearts for mission. Had we known then what we're doing now, and this, we love Westbrook and we love you, but had we known then what we're doing now, we wouldn't have done it. We wouldn't have come. Because we thought we'd determined our life. A disciple relinquishes self-determination. Number two, discipleship is not and never is and never can be risk-free. I am going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prisons and hardship are facing me. Discipleship never can be risk-free. We walk by faith, not by sight. Now, we want a risk-free world. We want to be helmeted, and vaccinated and fully insured against any eventuality. And then we want Jesus just in case when we die there really happens to be heaven. So I want every eventuality of my life covered. Discipleship is not risk-free, friends. Ricky and Autumn, we will pray God's greatest blessing on you next week, but trouble and hardship awaits you. And some glory and joy. But if you knew, you wouldn't go, Ricky. If God unfolded the next five years of your life to you, you'd have a nervous breakdown today. And discipleship can never be risk-free. Settle it. Brothers and sisters, fear has gripped our age. My father in 1943, boarded a troop ship with 5,000 other guys, two troop ships. The other one was sunk en route, all people perishing. He came home with four battle stars, Normandy, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and the Battle of the, West, of the Eastern Front. Four battle stars. And nobody from his group survived except him. Where is a spirit today that says, come on, Jesus, I'm ready for you, Lord. I want to serve, I want to go. Discipleship can never be risk-free. Here's a guarantee from Jesus, John chapter 16, verse 33. Let's put this up if we can. Here's Jesus' guarantee. In the world, you will have tribulation. That's the guarantee. But take courage. I have overcome the world. Now these days, we're amazed when someone takes any aggressive steps of discipleship. In 1976, 1976, I slept out all night, not half the night, 
all night on a concrete sidewalk in the winter, not the spring, in the winter, in the snow, all night, to get tickets for the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> and I got them, front row. And nobody thought me strange. You did that? Like, wow, man. Like, that was so, like, cool, like, amazing, like, wow. But let someone today say, darling, I'm going to the prayer meeting. Oh, please don't. Please don't. You're so busy. Darling, let's go love our neighbors. Oh, but we, you know, they might think us strange. I'm considering the mission field. Oh, you can't go. Listen, it's not guaranteed that you won't perish in the service of Christ or lose your job, or lose your friends, or lose your girlfriend, or lose whatever in the service of the king of kings. Where we think it's strange when someone stretches for Jesus. But it's not strange. It's wonderful. Moms and dads, don't hold your children back from serving Jesus. Release them. Don't say, well, sweetheart, you might get hurt. You must stay. Say, sweetheart, you might get hurt. You must know Jesus and go. Elizabeth Elliot wrote these words. God is not looking for a great man of faith. He's looking for a common man who trusts his great faithfulness. God will not protect you from anything that will make you more like Jesus. That's something, isn't it? God will not protect you from anything that will make you more like Jesus. We sing it, we pray it. Oh, I want to be like you, Lord. Okay. What's going to take this? Principle number three we see in this passage. Number one, a disciple relinquishes self-determination. Number two, discipleship is not risk-free. Number three, Paul's job, our job, is obedience. God's job is consequences. That's really important that we get that. Our job is to obey. God's job is to worry about the consequences of our obedience. And sometimes we get hung up on the consequences so we never obey. If Paul was thinking, well, if I go to Jerusalem... This might happen, this might happen, this might happen, or that might happen. i got to fix those things first, and then I'll go. He would have never gone. It's the job of the disciple to say, Lord, that is up to you what happens there. As I take these steps of faith, Lord, trusting in your goodness as my Savior, I leave the consequences to you. My job is obedience. A lot of what we call struggling is simply delayed obedience. A lot of what we call struggling is simply delayed obedience. If I would go on and obey and trust God, and it's not foolhardy, dear friends, to trust God. He's a good God. He's a wonderful God. If I will trust God and get on and obey God, I will see him work. An unsurrendered will will lead to a frustrated life. Are you living a frustrated life? Is your will surrendered? to this good God, Jesus Christ, who promises you nothing except himself. That's the promise. The guarantee is Jesus. He is the guarantee. In this world, you will have tribulation. People are so willing to serve Satan, aren't they? I mean, people are. They'll tithe to him all over the place. 
so reluctant to serve Jesus, but it's in Christ where the sweetness is. And that's the fourth thing. Jesus is good and there is a sweetness in his service. If you're going to settle that a discipleship relinquishes self-determination, if you're going to settle that discipleship is not risk-free, if you're going to settle that our job is obedience and God's job is consequences, then also settle that there's a sweetness in serving Jesus. He's wonderful. One thing I've done through the years, I've read many, many, many Christian biographies. It's kind of been a a habit of mine. I would encourage you to do the same. Reading the stories of men and women and boys and girls. Read the story of Mary Slessor who walked days and days and days and days across Wales to get a Bible. Was it Mary Slessor? Was that her name? Mary Jones who walked just to get a Bible. True story. She wanted a Bible more than she wanted anything. Reading the stories of men and women, boys and girls, who have served Jesus. One of my heroes is John Payton, and I've told you this story probably before. My children tell me, Dad, you're starting to loop now, and so be it. When he, when he went to the elders of his church in Scotland and said, I'm called to the New Hebrides in the South Pacific to the cannibals, to the cannibals to preach Christ there. And they said this, they are cannibals. They will eat you. We will not allow you to go. And he said to them, this young man said to the elders in his church, and the worms will eat you. So you're going to get eaten and I'm going to get eaten. What's the difference here? I'm going. And he went and he took his wife Mary with them. They were there a year when Mary died. Mary said these words before she died. She said, if I had it to do over again, I would do it again, but with more joy. And then two weeks later, his baby boy died. There's no internet. There's no Christian radio. He's in the middle of the South Pacific uh, a universe away from home. And he wrote these words, but for Jesus, I would have gone mad. But for Jesus, I would have gone mad. By the time he finished his life 40 years later, arguably that entire culture had come to Christ. He wrote these words. Let me record my immovable conviction that this is the noblest service in which any human being can spend or be spent and that if God gave me back my life to be lived over again, I would without one quiver of hesitation lay it all on the altar for Christ that he might use it as before in similar ministries of love. Why do I tell us stories like this? Almost week by week. It's not to make us feel guilty because we haven't gone to the New Hebrides. If the Holy Spirit does that to you, that's fine. That's not my job to convict. It's to encourage us that In our circumstance, there is sweetness in serving Jesus. And that if we can be strengthened and ennobled by men and women who have gone before us and done impossible things and discovered sweetness in it, perhaps we can do the same in our world and in our culture here. As a learner of Christ, I've read hundreds of biographies of those who have lived their fleeting lives in the service of Jesus. I've read of many trials and of countless hardships, but there's been one consistent thread through all of them. The sweetness of serving Jesus. One reads of no regrets toward Christ. One discovers the mercies and kindnesses of Jesus being multiplied in story after story, after story. In fact, the word sacrifice is rarely, if ever, heard in the stories of these men and women. The word privilege often is. You don't read these men and women and these boys and girls and hear them saying, oh, I've sacrificed so much for Jesus. They don't think that way. 
what a privilege it's been to serve Jesus. If I had it to do over again, I would do it better only with, and with more joy. If I had a thousand lives, I would live them for Christ. That's what they say. There's a sweetness in serving Jesus. There's a wonderfulness in saying, I don't know. I don't know what this life will look like. I, I don't have to know. And dear friend, if you're all caught up in trying to lay your life out so that you know everything, where you're going to retire, what it's going to look like, how many kids you're going to have, how they're going to live, you're going to get so twisted up, you won't be able to follow Jesus. And you're always going to feel bummed out and half guilty. Let it go. Say, all right, Lord. I don't know. I don't have to know. I don't have to have everything solved. When my wife and I got married in 1982, we knew three things. We loved each other, we loved Jesus, and we were better together. That's all we knew. We didn't know more. And that was enough. I love this little passage from Paul. I'm going to Jerusalem. And I have no idea what's going to happen there. But it doesn't matter. Because my life, my agenda, what I want is not what's important anymore. I want to testify to Christ. I want to live for Jesus. Those aren't just words for the apostle. Those are to be typical of the attitude of every follower of Christ. Brothers and sisters, are we free? Are we free? Are you free? For freedom, Christ has set us free. Free from having to know. Free from having to figure it all out. Free from having to get it all fixed first and then we'll do it. There's freedom in trusting Jesus and in not knowing. May the Lord lead us on an adventure of faith as a church. May the Lord make Westbrook Church, Westbrook Church, a mighty weapon for good in his hands. Do we not want that? And we don't know what it's going to look like. This COVID thing and, you know, the election. and I, We need to pray for our country. As a matter of fact, the prayer meeting next month, we'll pray for revival in this country because we need a spiritual awakening here. Amen? But we don't know what it's going to look like. We only know that trouble and hardship await us, and it does. And there'll be plenty of joy along the way. But it doesn't matter that we might finish the course and testify to Christ. If you want anything less than that, it is my prayer that you will either have a spiritual revolution or you'll be so uncomfortable here that you'll, and I say this in love, you'll end up just having to go somewhere else. Because they say, all they talk about in this church is Jesus and mission and loving your neighbor and getting out there because that's what this is about, friends. And it's about nothing less. Let go. Let go. Mary Payton, oh, if I could do it again, I would do it, only with more joy this time. There's a sweetness in serving Jesus. Let's bring our hearts to him right now. Let's every heart come before him. I don't want us to close this service too fast. If you're here with your husband or your wife or your your children, maybe you want to hold hands and get a little prayer huddle there. Or if you're here by yourself, sit next to a brother or sister. Let's just take a few moments with this. Autumn and Ricky, as you get ready to go. Jake, as you get ready to step into an, app an apprenticing role. There's a freedom in not knowing anything except Jesus. Are you holding on because you can't trust Christ? 
Are you saying, Lord, reveal everything to me and then I'll obey? You can't do that. It won't work that way. We cannot be vaccinated and helmeted and insured against what it means to follow Jesus in this world. Amen? But he is sweet and he is good. Amen to that, friends? And there's a, a joy in following Christ. Lord, thank you for the freedom of not knowing, but of trusting. Thank you for the freedom of not having to know, Lord. Lord, if we knew, we wouldn't live through this day. We'd go crazy. We know you, Lord. That's the victory. Lord, would you set us free to whatever radical discipleship look, looks like for us, Lord. We can't be John Payton. We can't be Hudson Taylor, but we can be us. We can be us, Lord. We can't be Elizabeth Elliot, but I can be me. Take my life, Lord. Take our lives and do wonderful things through surrendered lives. We relinquish self-determination. We confess that this is not risk-free. We confess that our job is obedience and your job is consequences. And we confess that there is a sweetness and a goodness in following Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.